so much of our life is lived in a fog of automatic habitual behavior. We spend so much time on the hunt, but nothing ever quite does it for us. And we get so wrapped up in the hunt that it kind of makes us miserable. I had everything I ever wanted. I had everything I was supposed to have. Everyone around me said, you're successful. But really, I was miserable. There was this gaping void in my life. So, I tried to fill that void the same way many people do, with stuff, lots of stuff. I was filling the void with consumer purchases. I was spending money faster than I was earning it, attempting to buy my way to happiness. I thought I'd get there one day. Eventually, I mean, happiness had to be somewhere just around the corner. I was living paycheck to paycheck, living for a paycheck, living for stuff. But I wasn't living at all. At a time when people in the West are experiencing best standard of living in history, why is it that at the same time there is such a longing for more? I think of that as a kind of biological based delusional craving. That auto craving is a good strategy to keep animals alive, including early human animals, in really harsh conditions. But these days, today, it creates a disconnect. You're like a puppet whose strings are being pulled by Mother Nature and evolution, reaching back tens of millions of years. We still feel restless. We still are always scratching and clawing for more. It's why lottery winners are miserable. It's why homeowners have three car garages. The first car creates an exponential, awesome rush of happiness and joy and utility. The second car comes about because we get tired of the first car. And as humans, we're wired to become dissatisfied. It's an addiction, really. And we are encouraged to maintain the addiction through technology and information. American culture has for the most part, these blinders on. There's definitely this illusion of what our lives should look like, whether it's advertising or your Instagram or Facebook feed. It's this illusion that our lives should be perfect. It's natural to use other people's lives and even imagined lives you know, that, that infections we see in advertisements as a yardstick. You open Vanity Fair or Esquire and you see very sexy and glamorous lives. And then the projects for most people seem to speak of, you know, how can I get that or as, as close to that as I'm going to get? There can be an immense amount of dissatisfaction trying to live that way. And many of us see no alternative but to live that way. 
Advertising has polluted and infiltrated culture. It's in our movies. It's in our television shows. It's in our books. It's in our doctor's offices. It's in the taxi cabs. It's in the bar sitting next to you. The person you think you're just having an idle chat with could have been placed there by an alcohol company. It's been a slow evolution. This is not something that just happened yesterday. This is something that has been sold to us over, say, the past hundred years, slowly but surely, by those that want to make a whole lot of money. Now that's what I call a good-looking cop. They want us to believe that you really need these things. Al Gore's movie, The Inconvenient Truth, won him an Oscar. And yet, much of the movie is nonsense. Sea level may rise 20 feet is absurd. Even the ice. This is Al Gore. He always goes down the road of hyperbole. Not only is he losing the argument on climate change, but he's losing the science as well. You don't go see Joseph Goebbels' films to see the truth about Nazi Germany. You don't want to go see Al Gore's film to see the truth about global warming. And it's the most severe winter storm in years which would seem to contradict Al Gore's hysterical global warming theories. Now, Donald Trump says he's had it up to here with Al Gore and is calling for the Nobel Peace Prize Committee to take the prize away. Yes or no, do you believe that human-caused global warming is a moral, ethical, and spiritual issue affecting our survival? Yes, I do. Uh, yes or no, do you believe that reducing fossil fuel-based uh, uh, energy usage will lead to lower greenhouse gas emissions? Basically, yes. I don't think we can be considered more than if I could just... Uh, well, you can. Now, it seems that everything is blamed on global warming. Last summer, we had a heat wave. Everyone said, oh, that's proof it's global warming. Then we had a mild December. Oh, that's proof. Global warming is taking place. Now, I, I, I wonder how come you guys never seem to notice it when it gets cold? The National Academy of Sciences here in this country and in the uh, 16 largest or most developed countries in the world agrees with. My time has almost expired. I can hear you very well. I've seen this minute. Well, I Everybody, global warming in the media, join the course. Senator, I'm asking the rest of the question, not giving the man a minute to answer. Please. Uh, Senator, uh, thank you. Um, I was sitting here trying to think what I could ever say that. Uh, might make it possible to reach out to you, and I, I'm serious about this. Um, I'd love to uh, talk with you without the cameras and without the lights, and uh, I tell you uh, uh, why I feel so strongly about this.
parents first brought me to see the park when I was very young. From that point forward, he was hooked. It meant everything to me because, you know, I'd never wanted anything more. I remember you being probably in first or second grade, watching National Geographic specials or mutual Loma High specials and seeing whales and seeing dolphins. You know, as a little kid, just being really incredibly inspired by it. I never went to see one. I grew up in New York, so I went to the Bronx Zoo. I grew up on a lake, the horses, we swam the horses. I grew up around the ocean. I came from the middle of the country in Flatland, Kansas, so I am from Virginia. I traveled down and did the theme park thing in, in Orlando when I was 17, and uh, saw the night show at Shannon Stadium. Very emotional, you know, popular music, and I was just uh, very driven to want to do that. And I saw what the trainers did, and I said, that's what I want to do. One of the trainers there said, what are you doing out there? You should be a trainer. I'm going to train animals, and there are training animals in my life. How do you prepare yourself for an encounter with an 8,000 pound or sinus walker? I always thought you needed, like, a master's degree in marine biology to be a trainer. It takes years of study and experience to meet the strict requirements necessary. Come to find out, it really is more about your personality and how good you can swim. I went and tried out, got the job right away. I was like, yeah, I'm so excited, you know, I'm so, so excited. I really wanted to be there. I really wanted to do the job. I couldn't wait to get in the water with the animals. And I really was proud of being a school trainer. You know, I thought this was the most amazing job. I showed up there on my first day, not really knowing what to expect. I was told to put on a wetsuit and get in the water. Oh, I was scared out of my wits. First of all, I put my wits on backwards because I was raised on <laughs> in a farm in Virginia. <laughs> my first thought, memory of that time was that dolphins are a lot bigger <laughs> than they look when you get in the water next to them. Well, I watched this sea lion on her show, and it's kind of like Morocco. He comes out during the show with a dress on as, as Dorothy, the alter ego of Dorothy, in a dress with a sea lion. Howard sea right? He's walking along with this little basket, and I go, I would never, ever do that, you know? Two months later, hi, I'm Dorothy! <laughs> walking out on stage with the sea line. <laughs> I was overwhelmed, and I was so excited. I mean, just seeing a killer whale is breathtaking. I was just in awe. It's shocking to see how large they are and how beautiful they are. This is a story about clothing. It's about the clothes we wear, the people who make these clothes, and the impact that it's having on our world. It's a story about greed and fear, power and poverty. It's complex as it extends all the way around the world, but it's also simple, revealing just how connected we are to the many hearts and hands behind our clothes. I came into this story with no background in fashion at all, beginning with nothing more than a few simple questions. What I've discovered has forever changed the way I think about the things I wear, and my hope is that it might just do the same for you. Maybe just start and, and say your name and talk about how this kind of began. My name is Lucy Siegel. I am a journalist and a broadcaster based in the UK. And I have been obsessed, consumed with the environmental and social impacts of the fashion industry for about a decade. 
Well, I love everything about clothes. You know, I love I love the poetry, I love the fabric, I love the colors, I love the textures, I love the way that they make you feel. You know, they are our chosen skin. Well, I had the classic massive closet, clothes everywhere, bags constantly coming into my house, you know, every day, every other day with some other item in, and never had anything to wear. I could never put together a coherent outfit. We communicate who we are to a certain extent through clothing. And this is, this is again, throughout history. You know, you have the transit court, you know, again, Marie Antoinette making these chats. It's always been, it's our personal communication in many ways. That's what interests me, that it is fundamentally a part of what um, we wish to communicate about ourselves. And we used to have a system, a fashion system, where people would go to the uh, shows and they would do spring, summer, autumn, winter. And those kind of ran like clockwork for very many years. Okay, rip that up, throw it out the window. That has absolutely nothing to do with the fashion industry today. It has been reinvented. The shift is moving ruthlessly um, towards a way of producing which only really looks after big business interest. Growing up, I never gave much thought to anything other than the price of the clothes that I bought, usually making choices based on style or a good deal. Looking back, I learned that for a long time, most of our clothing was actually made right here in America. As recently as the 1960s, we were still making 95% of our clothes. Today, we only make about 3%. The other 97% is outsourced to developing countries around the world. I've been in the business for over nine years now. In terms of scale, we've got about 25,000 people just on the garment manufacturing side. We produce one in six dresses sold in the US. If you actually go to a store and you benchmark the price of a garment over the last 20 years, you will find that it's actually a deflation of the product, i.e. the price has gone down over time. Now, has our cost gone down? Absolutely not, okay? The cost has gone up. The more production we've outsourced, the cheaper prices have become on the clothing we buy, making way for a whole new model known as fast fashion, almost overnight transforming the way clothing is bought and sold. The newest H&M store on 5th Avenue in Manhattan is the company's largest ever and just one of many new stores it's planning around the country. It's all part of a high street revolution, fast fashion. Instead of two seasons a year, we practically have 52 seasons a year. So we have something new coming in every week. And fast fashion is creating this so that it can essentially shift our product. <laughs> consumers, they really have vast fashion market data now, and we know from before that American consumers are very valuable. If we match these two together with fashion and value, then we have a recipe. One Japanese clothing retailer is making a fast, curious mark here in the U.S. The price has dropped. The way of making that product has completely, completely changed. And you have to ask yourself at some
filming. My name is Chris, and I grew up just outside of New York City. This is Zach, and he's a close friend of mine from Seattle. We've grown up with very similar lives. These are the houses we were born in. Our families. The awkward middle school days. The sports we played. And these are the things we did for fun. I met Zach during my first year at college. And we quickly became close friends. Our lives are fast paced. And these are the things that we're used to seeing every day. This is Chino. He is 12 years old and lives in a rural village in Guatemala. He lives in extreme poverty on less than $1 a day. How can we begin to understand what his life is like, about what it means to live every day with no clean water, little food, and poor shelter? And just like Chino, there are over 1.1 billion people around the world that survive on $1 a day. Zach and I study international development in school, but there are some things that a textbook just can't answer. So we're creating a plan to spend our summer living on only $1 a day in a rural Guatemalan village, in Chino's village. I love you. Okay, bye mom, I love you. Bye. Why do it? I, mean, I think it's just an amazing opportunity to learn for myself what it really means to live under a dollar a day, which coming from this reality, I can't really say I have any idea. We're bringing along two filmmakers setting out to better understand the reality of extreme poverty firsthand. Let's do this. Beginning our journey in Guatemala City with a six hour ride on the back of a crowded chicken bus. We are headed to the village of Peña Blanca that's representative of rural poverty in many parts of the world. In these remote areas of Guatemala, seven out of ten people live under the poverty line. Is that hitting something? Well, I, think, I think we've got a boundary of like a big rock right here, so it's going to have to be our edge. <laughs> oh god. I cannot believe it came out. So one of those ideas that we were talking about. Oh, we're right here. Audio yeah, recording. Check. Filming, filming. So I go there, it was raining. 
I must have wake up the whole neighborhood, you know. It was not closing the box, it was nailing the coffin. I am nailing the coffin, I, I see it as that. Why, why this expression, why this thought? Well, maybe death is now looking uh, through, the, through the golden frame of this dream and now reality is going to maybe chop me into death. So now I am Tuesday, the 6th of August. Donc c'était tendu, mais on était excité, on avait hâte que ça commence. Tout était prêt. Alan était absolument sombre, euh, Philippe extrêmement tendu, moi j'étais euh, classique et très inquiète. Donc j'étais déguisé des ménagères avec casque, chemise, pour faire américain, donc beaucoup de stylo dans la poche, il paraît que ça allait être typique américain. I was going to be on the crew in the South Town. We were going to go at closing time with a big hamper with all the gear in it. And there were going to be some guys in the North Tower dressed for business with much less gear. An architect, too. And I believe that was holding the bow. There's electricity in the air between Jean Louis and Albert. I can read it in Jean's face. He doesn't trust Albert. I'd bet he uh, does something wrong with this guy. He's not totally the same uh, choice that we are. Was in the air. I assumed that even in the best possible situation, that we were all going to be arrested. 